Good morning and welcome to EBC's online campus. We are so glad you are with us today. We, we love the fact that you've, you stay committed to this experience and to this method of experiencing worship as a community. Yes. yes. So today's theme is Dr. Blue. Well, today's theme in the children's ministry. Yes, in the Sierra, children's Sierra ministry. Sierra serves with our children's ministry. Absolutely. So, our so theme, she's back greeting the kids in her costume. This is not what she normally dresses like. Right. I don't look like this on a daily. Yes, yes. But today's theme is Dr. Blue, and we're, um, our theme is Jesus does his part, so let's suit up and do ours. Yes. Oh, this is like an official name. To, oh, that's your driver's yeah, license. No, yeah, you know, we're not going to say it's my driver's oh, okay, license, okay. but yeah, it's a tag. It's a tag. I, yeah. I thought, wow, this is an official official medical thing but no no it's just driver's license um so yeah so you can um, catch up with us on uh social media during the week and stay connected to everything we have going on at the church uh, there's always great uh, t uh content on there that we share from our services yes. great quotes great scriptures to keep you encouraged during the week i always say if you're if you're in the middle of the week and life seems stressful and hard, just type in EB, at EBC in your city and and connect there because there'll be an encouraging word that's bright right. for your moment or a sermon clip or a quote from Dr. Oliver uh, that, that you need uh, in your life right at that moment. So, right. so this, um, this week, I actually got a reminder from Facebook and it was so good because I was like, oh, I gotta get to, I gotta get to my Bible study, you know? Oh, yeah, and I was Bible so study. happy yes, that yes. I signed up for a Facebook group and there's groups like that that keeps us reminded so that we can tap back in. Right, EBC. right. So if you follow us on Facebook, you'll get an alert that when we go live on Sundays or for Bible study or even when we post new content. Yes. So be sure and follow us on those social media platforms. Right. And on the social media platforms, you'll see small clips. Um, again, so all of our clips when I have on these nice costumes yes. are shot by one of our own youth. That's He's awesome. 10 years old. His name is Hunter. So make sure you tune in so you can see those little clips. Yeah, that's one thing I love about EBC is we're striving to be a multi-generational church. Yes. Uh, you know, we have some teens that volunteer in our media ministry even and nice. looking to expand that a little bit more as we come back uh, to in-person experiences. So that's another thing. Uh, we love having this hybrid experience. So Absolutely. not only are we online, we have people in the room. Good morning, everybody. Yes, always so good. Yes, uh, welcome back. So we love this hybrid experience where we have a whole online community and a whole in-person community. Right. We also just did our woe. So um, I actually went and watched it again, even oh, well, though I well, was women's here. Ministry, yes. yeah, yeah, so, women's ministry, yes. Yeah, women's ministry. And we have one coming up in, in a couple, uh, uh, the last Saturday of June. So Nice. Yeah, it's an, so it's I watched a, it here live, and then oh, yeah. I went and watched it again because God touched me. So when God moves you, you got to do the work. You got to put your yes, foot, put it in yes, shoe level. Yes. Well, we have an awesome experience planned for you guys today. Uh, the worship team is joining us on stage. Hey, everybody. Yes. Hey, they're going to bring they it ready. today. Let's so, turn up. Yes. We, so we're so glad you were with us today. We hope you enjoy the experience. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 There
You can keep looking High and low You still won't find nobody Nobody's great I know it's not correct English Nobody's good Nobody's good Nobody's great for this worship experience this encounter with the mighty great and awesome God Lord you're so majestic you're so awesome and you're so powerful you're so worthy of all of our praise God in this moment we surrender our wills we surrender our lives we surrender our thought life to you right now in the name of Jesus Father, we make room for whatever you want to do on today in our lives, in our homes, in our minds. Hallelujah. Father, we are surrendered. Empty vessels saying, fill us up, God. Fill us up, God. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us up, Lord, with more of you. Fill us up, God. Fill us up, God. Fill us up with more of you. Father, we're surrendered in this moment. We say, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Tear down our old mentalities. Tear down our traditions. Tear down our religions. Tear down our unrealistic expectations. And our expectations are only of you. Father, thank you for meeting us right where we are in need. It is your name we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you ready, Jason? Yes, we're rolling. Okay. <laughs> See, you do this so you can get outtakes, so you can put us on like. <laughs> oh, it's been two years. Y'all have never seen an outtake. <laughs> but I might, yes. As we move forward to become the church that God has ordained, destined, and declared that we're a <laughs> I was so smooth. Well, that's it for today. We would encourage. <laughs> I knew that was too easy. Join us online this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for our series, Understand the All. And all of the women of WOW, as we take a journey on. As we take a journey. During the course of the registration process, you will be prompted with the question of whether or not you attend intent. Better yet, are you looking for a ministry that you can connect with? A ministry that you can connect with? Better yet, looking for a ministry that you can connect with to... Mm -hmm. Looking for a ministry that will allow you to... Why can't I say it? Whenever you're ready. Okay, uh... To deal with whatever God had. Huh? Okay. And so I pray and trust that uh, Joseph's life has been insightful. <laughs> One second. <laughs> oh, God, the phone is going off. I thought I cut it off. <laughs> Shucks. Anyone who you think that... Oh. We want to wish you a happy 48th anniversary. I'll be God, dog. And the first one was good. <laughs> oh, my God. Really, the first one was really good. Let's do it again. The first one was really good. You have come a long way. I don't want to do that. Let me do it again. Oh, you done come a mighty long way. I was getting ready to go a mighty long way. Oh, okay. All right. Happy birthday, Lady Oliver. We love you. Nope, that was awful. I'm going to have to do it again because I didn't say the line the way I said it before. From Eunice Louise. Uh, 
Hello, EBC family. We are so excited to be back together for yet another Sunday worship experience. Whether you are in person at one of our campuses or if you are a part of our online family, we welcome you today and we are excited to have you here. Listen, don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on all of our digital platforms. We want to make sure that we stay in touch with you and that we're able to connect with you. To our in-person worshiping family, we thank you so much for your diligence in adhering to our COVID protocols. Thank you so much for helping to create an atmosphere wherein we're able to continue to gather together in the most safe and responsible way possible. To that end, we're going to ask that you would continue to honor the mask mandates that we have in place, wherein you would keep your mask on during our worship services. This is simply a way for us to continue to provide a safe environment for all of our worshipers. We thank you in advance for your cooperation. Hey, ABC, it's Allison Parker. I'm joined here with Dr. Hall, our campus pastor at Conyers, and also here with our special guest today, Anika, the founder of Show Me Shoes. So Reach 100 is out in our community. We're finding these organizations who are doing so much great work here locally. And so we are here to present Anika with something very special. So I'm gonna let Dr. Hall take it from there. We're sewing today into Show Me Shoes and their mission is rebuilding confidence, starting with the soul, the S-O-L-E. That'll preach. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna share this check with you. You can Thank open you. it for us and we want our congregation to oh my God. see how I'm it look. Look. I'm shaking, I'm so nervous. I know it's <laughs> it. Oh, I got that in. Thank y'all so, so much for just believing in this mission. I'm gonna just start, start there. Oh Lord. <laughs> Y'all, I wore my good lashes today. Hold on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you thank so wow. Welcome. What a blessing. What a blessing. Y'all, oh my goodness. Um, thank you. I got a couple more meetings after this, so I got to keep these lashes on, okay? Um, thank you so much. Like, what we can do with this, um, the pandemic has definitely shifted our mission. Um, and what's crazy, when it changed, we noticed the elevation, the support from other communities and donations have skyrocketed because they found the need. And this is going to change so many girls' lives. We have some amazing things planned for this fall. Y'all have no idea. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Listen, that's the least we could do. Thank you for being committed to the mission. Thank you for being faithful to where God has called you to be and been a great leader in our community. This is our privilege, our blessing as a church to be generous. Thank you so much, EBC, for your generosity. God is using us in tremendous ways. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and you and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, His name is worthy to be praised. I will bless the Lord at all times, and His praises shall continually be in my mouth. This is another day's journey, and I'm glad about it. Is there anyone in here that feels like giving God praise, feel like giving God glory? Come on, open up your mouth even right now and bless the name of our God. Come on and give him praise. Come on and give him glory. Come on and bless his name even now. Our God is great. Our God is glorious. And we bless his name on today. And we give God praise for each and every one of you on this day. You who join us, of course, on campus and as well as the thousands of you that join us around the world in the virtual space, our e-church, we thank God that you press your way into this communal worship experience. And it is just that, it is a communal worship experience. As we come together, as the people of God to give God praise and to give God glory. And again, we welcome each and every one of you and we thank God for your presence. Once and again, go ahead and give God praise and glory. And in whatever context you share in this communal worship, whether on campus, we encourage you to lean into this moment, to be present where you are. If you're sharing with us in our virtual space online, again, we wanna encourage you to be engaged in that setting. You have the chat box engaged in that setting. And even as you are now sharing in this moment of worship, center your hearts upon God and expect God to do something amazing and to say something that will literally change your life for the better. God bless you. Again, brothers and sisters, I'm super excited that we're here again on today. And I'm also excited to have a friend 
personal friend, and I can honestly say that, and one who is providing leadership to our uh, county, and of course, one in whom God has assigned and anointed for this particular season in his life to provide leadership, of course, to our uh, county. And I speak in regards of our dear brother, brother, brother Patrick Labat, who is with us today. He's, of course, the Fulton County Sheriff. Let's give God praise for his presence today. And not only his presence, but also his lovely wife, who is with us as well. Jacqueline, we thank God for the two of them. Let me give you some quick little um, true facts as it relates to our sheriff. We actually went to school together at Clark, and we was on the same tennis team. We played tennis together. I'm not going to tell you, between the two of us, who won most of the matches. I'm not going to do that. Uh, but he's a lefty, if I'm not... Uh, if I recall, a lefty. And uh, so he was a little tricky type of person to play against, my being a righty. But again, nonetheless, we welcome you, sir. Come and greet us if you don't mind. Give him another wonderful hand as he would come and share with us on the day. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My wife gave me one instruction, and that was to don't end up on that blooper reel. <laughs> Some of y'all will get that on the way home. Uh, look, I am on behalf of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office and the, the sheroes and heroes that, that work there. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for your leadership. And EBC, thank you for having us. Thank you for helping us close the gap between law enforcement and our community, building stronger bridges. And more important than tennis, I've been able to watch the shepherd of this house grow and continue to lead in our community. And, and if you're like me, I'm, I'm a little selfish, so to be able to say a personal friend, I get goosebumps every time I see him, whether it be virtually or in our community doing the things that you all allow us to do. And so for my wife Jackie and I, it is absolutely a pleasure to bring greetings. It is absolutely a pleasure and an honor to be your friend. And ahead of time, if you'll put your hands together, uh, because this is a gift that you have a soon to be newly appointed bishop. <laughs> wow. Thank you all, thank you all. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so, so while we were at Clark playing tennis, who thought this would be wow. uh, our path? But I am extremely proud and I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Love you as well, man. Thank you so much. Listen, family, let's, let's have a word of prayer. I want to pray because the manner of leadership is a heavy mantle to wear. And oftentimes when a person is thrust into a position of leadership, we have expectations of everything being done immediately. And the reality of leadership is that we oftentimes we inherit stuff that takes time to work through the process. It takes time to reframe and to give a different sense of guidance and direction. And so I would ask of you that you and I would stand even right now in a moment of prayer. And let's pray for our sheriff and as well as his wife. Can I ask, Sister Lamont, if you will come out as well? Because the burden of leadership is not just carried just by him, but also by the one who stands alongside of him. And so I want to pray for the two of them. Let's pray. God, how we honor you and how we thank you and how we bless you for this day that you have made. We thank you, God, for the privilege of prayer and the power that you grant through prayer and the provisions that you make through prayer. And I now, Father, Father, pause and pray for this, your servant and leader. Father, you know, of course, all that lies ahead and all that has been placed upon him. And so, Father, I pray now that you would give him wisdom like Solomon, give him courage like David, give him a building blueprint like Nehemiah, give him, oh God, even right now, the sense of compassion and empathy that is modeled in your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray for his wife, I pray for their entire family, and Father, I pray for your protection upon them. In Jesus' name I pray and amen. God bless you. Come on and again, give God praise and glory. Thank you all so much. Love you much.
Well, EBC, at this time, we're preparing to worship God by way of giving. What a joy it is to give. What an honor it is to give. What a blessing it is to give. And even as we prepare to give today, we give, of course, recognizing the goodness of God, the grace of God, the blessings of God that are upon our lives. As we give today, we give as has indicated as an act of worship, as an act of faith, as an act of obedience. You have just witnessed the result of our unhindered generosity as our church, as a result of your generosity, was able to be a blessing to an organization that is making an impact in our community as we have sown $10,000 in their efforts. Come on, give God praise for that. The $10,000 that we sowed was as a result, as many of you may recall, last year, the second Sunday of December, we took the entire offering that was raised on that second Sunday of December and decided to give it all, the, all away. And as a result of that one particular Sunday, we raised close to $1 million in one Sunday. And we're giving all of it away. We're giving every brown penny of it away. And so listen, I want to encourage you to give today. I want to encourage you to give your tithe. And I recognize, of course, that there's a whole lot of social media conversation as it relates to tithing. And let me just be 100 with you. I, I trust God too long with tithing to turn around now. God has been too good and God has opened doors and God has blessed in magnificent and incredible ways. Anyone here can testify that you did exactly what God said, try me and see, try me and see if I would not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings. Listen, let me make mention of this very quickly. I've had a lot of pastor friends to call me and ask my response. And here is my response and I'm just gonna make this statement one time. I pastor Elizabeth Baptist Church. This is the church that God has assigned for me to pastor. And other people pastor wherever it is that God has assigned for them to pastor. And we all, at the end of the day, have to give an account to God as it relates to our theological and ideology uh, of views. And so again, uh, one of my dear friends, and I claim him as that publicly, I have no shame in saying so, has his particular view as it relates to tithing. And he has his right to have his view and to lead the congregation as he's so see that God has called him to lead. But I also have the right to lead you. And we do believe in tithing. We do believe in giving. We do believe in honoring God. And we believe that because I believe it is the word of God. And we also see the biblical principle that as we honor God, God in turn will honor us. And tithing is a process wherein we prioritize God even in our giving. We prioritize God even in our giving. And do, we do believe that we give unto God a tenth part of that in which God has blessed us to receive of our increase and of our income, recognizing again that God, as we honor him, will honor us. There's a myriad of ways whereby you're able to give here at EBC, and we ask that you would consider these ways. The preferred way, of course, is that you would go to EBC or elizabaptist.org backslash giving and set up your account to become a reoccurring giver. And that way, of course, as you give, it would help our accounting department. And furthermore, even as you're moving about and traveling, you can be consistent as it relates to your giving. You can also scan the QR scan and you will see the menu that was pop, pop up along with the field that says give. And if you will hit that particular icon or that particular word, you will see again different ways where, whereby you're able to give. You can also text give and information is being shared with you now as it relates to this particular feature. And then last but not least, those who are watching online, you can mail in your tithe gifts and offerings to 4245 Cascade Road Southwest, Atlanta, Georgia 30331. However you ought to give, we thank God in advance for your believing in the vision and the mission that God has assigned unto our church. And we know that God will see to it that grace will always abound towards us to the degree that we will always have sufficiency towards every kingdom endeavor that God has entrusted to our hands and hearts to fulfill. Let's turn our hearts heavenward in a moment of prayer. God, how we honor you and how we thank you for the blessed privilege that is ours as we come now to give. Sanctify our seeds and multiply our seeds and may they be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom and the advancement of your cause. We thank you, O oh God, even right now for your good hand of favor and blessings that is upon us. We thank you, O oh God, that even as we honor you, you in turn will honor us. In Jesus' name we pray in. And all those that agree said, Amen. As you continue to prepare your hearts to give and to receive the word of God, I ask that you just take a moment right now and think about every provision God has made, every resource he has connected you to, 
and with gratitude, not because of only what he's done, but because of who he, he is. Just as the 24 elders at the throne, in gratitude for who God is, let us cast our crowns down at his feet and just say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. I don't hear anybody saying, Lord, I thank you. It's not necessarily in the clapping of your hands, but opening your mouth and recognizing it is from you that every blessing has come from. So Lord, I thank you. We do that at this moment, Father. We cast our crowns at, our feet, at your feet. We surrender to you in this moment. Here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender, this is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want my surrender here is where i lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender
I want to hear you say that because you're going to have to practice it this week. I will make. You're going to have to remind yourself on this by Wednesday. Hallelujah. We say yes, oh God. We say yes. You really know what's best, oh God. You really have a plan, oh God. You're really good, God. Not only are you good, you're good to me. Not only are you good, you're good to me. Yeah. Say, I will make room. I will make room for you. More than an ocean to do. God be all praise and a God be all of the glory. That particular song is a prerequisite for the sermon that I want to share with you today or the message that I want to share with you that is entitled Unhindered, Up Close and Personal with God. If you're going to have an up close and personal relationship with God, it requires that you have to make room for Him. Go ahead and claim your seats if you don't mind. And as a point of reference for our time of sharing we we'll consider Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2 collectively. As we look at Exodus 1 and chapter 2, I'm going to serve as your spiritual tour guide of sort as we'll travel through these two said books. And we'll stop and pause and look at certain scenes throughout these two chapters that will speak to the whole point of how you and I can have an up-close and personal relationship with God. Let us pray. God, how we honor you and how we thank you and how we bless you for this day and how we honor you we seek even now to make room for you even in this time of worship as we position and posture ourselves to hear your word holy spirit even now have your way in jesus name amen in this new summer sermon series entitled unhindered up close and personal with god we'll focus on the book of exodus and we'll consider the second most important character next to God in this particular book being that of Moses. This iconic leader of biblical antiquity casts his looming shadow across the pages of scripture as one who enjoyed an up close and personal relationship with God. Interestingly enough, when you consider how God used Moses, it was in a amazing way in that Moses, Moses is acknowledged as one to whom he had performed more miracles than anyone else in scripture other than, of Je other than that of Jesus Christ. And even at the close of his life, his earthly life, he gives and makes a cameo appearance again in the New Testament in what is known as the Mount of Transfiguration, where he stands alongside of Elijah as they talk with Jesus as is seen in Matthew chapter 17, verse two down to verse number three. And Moses, of course, against the backdrop of his checkered past, possess one of the most intimate relationships with God than any other personality throughout scripture. A matter of fact, when you and I consider one of the excerpts from his obituary, here's what it says about Moses as it relates to his greatness and his experience with God. It is there in Deuteronomy 34, verse number 10, where it says, and there was not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew, listen to this phrase, face to face. If this verse doesn't speak of being up close and personal with God, I don't know what verse does. Scripture says of God and Moses' relationship that it was one in which they knew each other, how, church? Face to face. Now let's be honest, who wouldn't want a relationship with God like Moses? Who wouldn't desire a relationship with God that is described in such a profound and intimate way? Unless you and I begin to falsely assume that this kind of relationship is impossible or is unachievable, let me assure you that you and I can have a similar sort of relationship with God. Furthermore, let me also assure you that God himself desire that you and I have an up close and personal relationship with him. But in order to have this type of up close and personal relationship with God, 
not only as the priest seem has just reminded us, not only, not only must we make room for him, but look, notice what James says in James 4 and verse number 8, draw near to God, that's your part, and here's what God says he would do, and he would draw near to you. And so there's this mutual, reciprocal re process of drawing near, drawing near to God. And God says, I'll draw near to you. And here's the other conditions. Now cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so as we examine the life of Moses in this sermon series, I want us to now consider from Exodus 1 and Exodus 2, at least three required actions in drawing near to God. Three required actions if you and I indeed will have an up-close and personal relationship with God. Here it is, number one, if you're taking notes. Number one, recognize God's plan for your future. Recognize God's plan for your future. Now, this is one of the key elements in drawing close to God, that you and I must recognize that our existence is not by accident, it is not by coincidence, it is not by happenstance. Instead, we are here due in part because of God's divine providence and purpose. Not even in part. We are here because God, in pre-existence time, established us with a purpose. And not just with a purpose, but that purpose was prenatal. In other words, even before we came out of our mother's womb into this world, God had a plan for our lives. Listen to what Psalms 139 verse 16 says. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. And so God had this prenatal, if you would, divine, sovereign, God-ordained plan that, plan that he had orchestrated for our lives even before we were formed and fashioned in our mother's womb. A matter of fact, case in point, we see evidence of that in the life of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, down to verse number 5, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And so God has appointed, assigned, and anointed plan for Jeremiah, not just for Jeremiah, but God had an anointed, appointed, and assigned plan for Moses' life, not just Jeremiah and Moses' life, but God has appointed and assigned and anointed plan for your life. Would you say that after me? God has an appointed, assigned, and an anointed plan for my life. Would you say like you really believe it? God has an assigned, an appointed, and an anointed plan for my life. Listen to this. Irregardless of your life circumstances, irregardless of your circumstances and con conditions of life, God says, I still have a plan for your life. Whether your life circumstance and context was good or bad, pretty or ugly, God says, my plan had not changed. Matter of fact, the events and the conditions of our lives cannot alter the ordained plan of God. And so even when we consider Moses, God's plan for Moses' life goes back some 600 years during the era of Abraham, the father of the Hebrew race. God had promised that Abraham and through his loins and lineage, all the nations of the earth would be blessed right there in Genesis 22, verse number 18. And in your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And so even the circumstances of this prophecy and its fulfillment was under unpleasant and even unfair circumstances. It still was God's plan. Matter of fact, listen to the unfair and even beyond that, the unpleasant circumstances of this prophecy. It is there in Genesis 15, verse 13, it says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, the one that God said, through your loins and through your lineage, all the nations will be blessed. Listen to the context. Listen to the circumstances. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offsprings will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now, I thought you said all oh, the nations were going to be blessed. But 
this other caveat to being blessed. We have to be sojourners. We have to as well be servants. And on top of that, we have to live with hard times for 400 years. God says, yep, that's part of the plan. And though this particular verse is a bitter verse uh, to swallow, God yet and still says to Moses and in regards to his people that they must endure 400 years of acute adversities, severe and a sustained season of suffering, yet and still it is a part of God's plan. Now in order to really appreciate this, we must understand some Old Testament patriarchal history. So from a whole Old Testament perspective, it is Jacob, who's the descendant of Abraham, who had 12 sons, one of which was Joseph. Due to jealousy and unbridled envy, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery as he was taken down to Egypt. And after enduring manifold adversities, it was Joseph who was, uh, who was promoted as the prime minister of Egypt. And as a result of such, after mending the ruptured relationship between him and his brothers, Joseph relocates his entire family from the promised land to Egypt as they are now escaping a place of famine. Fast forward now, Joseph dies, but notice what happens. In Exodus 1 verse 7 it says, but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now that Joseph is dead, there's a new sheriff in town, no point intended, <laughs> and now the town has fear. What is the fear? The fear is that now the people who had been oppressed will end up growing, and as they would grow, it now brings concern, it brings, if you would, threats to their sense of security regarding their supremacy and their dominancy, consumed with fear and becoming uh, consumed with fear that they may end up drifting down towards a minority group. The Hebrews, of course, will end up unifying themselves and perhaps develop some sort of military takeover and will leave the country. And so this new sheriff in town concocts a plan. He desires to retain their cheap slave labor force. He worked the Hebrews oppressively and ruthlessly by forcing them to make bricks without giving them adequate resources. And coupled with this oppressive work condition, a murderous population control plot was implemented, wherein the midwives were instructed to kill all the male Hebrew babies at birth, as is seen in chapter 1, verse 10 down to verse 16. But because the midwives feared God over government, feared God over government, feared God over government, they refused to obey the new Pharaoh's order. And as a result, all the newborn babies were to be thrown into the Niles River. But the Hebrews knew that God's promise was that all the nations would end up being blessed through Abraham's seed. They no doubt wondered if God had forgotten his promise. And during these terrible times, a Levite named Amron marries a Levite woman by the name of Jochebed. Between Amron and Jochebed and their union, they have two sons one by the name of Aaron and the other by the name of Moses. Now, in order to avoid this murderous plot of the new Pharaoh, Moses' mother builds and hides him in a little vessel, something like a small boat. This boat, of course, was covered with pitch and with tar. And she placed Moses inside of this vessel-like boat, strategically positioned him among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River, where she knew that Pharaoh's daughter would come to bathe. Moses' sister, by the name of Miriam, stayed close enough to see what was happening in chapter 2, down to verse 1 to verse number 4. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the baby crying, her heart was moved with compassion, and she said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. Now listen to what Miriam says in chapter 2, verse number 7. Then his sister, Miriam, Moses' sister, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call your nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? With the princess agreeing, Miriam goes and get guess who? Moses' mother. Moses' very mother to come and nurse Moses. Now as Moses begins to grow, he becomes even beyond that, a son to the princess. And so she names Moses 
Moses, which name simply means to be drawn out of the water. Now, what is interesting is while Moses was in Egypt, Moses had a full education in the wisdom of the Egyptian that was paid on their dime. Moses, of course, studied, studied all of the different st skills such as government and science and mathematics and law and even military tactics and even developed leadership skills. What is interesting is it was all a part of God's divine plan. The Egyptians ended up training the very man who will confront and conquer them. That's all a part of God's plan. What I'm trying to help you to see that nothing in your life just happens by accident or by coincidence. Please understand, child of God, that God has a plan for your life and oftentimes his plan comes with pain. Even the pains of parenthood and even your childhood crisis and even your adolescent agonies and your teenage tensions and your adulthood advers adversities, God says in the midst of all of that, I still have a plan. Regardless of your experiences, it could be good or bad, it could be pretty or ugly, you could have been resourced or under-resourced, God said you could have had talents or even training, God says at the end of the day, there's a redemptive and restorative plan that I have for your life. Would you say it again? God has an assigned, an appointed, and an anointed plan for my life. Would you say it one more time and make the demons in hell tremble? God has an anointed, an assigned, and an appointed plan for my life. Say it one more time so the angels in heaven can start rejoicing. God has an anointed, an appointed, and an assigned plan for my life. Come hell or high water, nothing can stop God's plan. Weapons may be formed, but weapons will not prosper because God has an anointed and a sign and an appointed plan for my life. Matter of fact, here's what Paul says. For we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God, which God, which God, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Sheriff, you, you was right. Who would have thought at Clark Atlanta, 1991 through 95, he got out sooner than I, that two young kids playing tennis one would end up passing the church and the next would end up being the sheriff. Though we didn't know it, had no clue about it, God has an anointed and an appointed and an assigned plan for our lives and no devil in hell or no demon can stop God's plan. You ought to give God praise right there. It was beforehand. So if you're going to have up close and personal encounter with God, recognize that God has a plan for your future. Say it again, God has a plan for my future. Oh, but if that's not good enough, here's the second one. Here it is. God not only has a plan for our future, we must also recognize that God has a place in our failures. You missed it. God has a place in our failure, because again, Moses' close and personal relationship with God was not based upon the fact that Moses lived without flaws, without fumbles, and without significant failures. Instead, Moses' story reveals something different. He was indeed a man who failed, and not just failed on one occasion, but failed on many occasions in his life. Like Moses, we too have missed the mark of God's righteous expectations and standards. The bottom line, we all have experienced some various degrees of failure that has taken shape and form in countless ways during our moments of failure. We have wondered and even wrestled with the thought, can God even use me again? 
We have all dealt with the tormenting thoughts that due to our failures, we would forever forfeit the favor and our future in God. And if you're vulnerable, if you're transparent enough, perhaps you can admit that there's been moments wherein you felt that your failures were too much even for God's forgiveness. And beloved, you're not alone. Moses stands among us as one who witnessed the grace, the mercies, the love, the compassion, the forgiveness of God that he extends, here it is, to those who have failed. Can you come with me now? I want to, as your tour guide, take you to chapter 2. And I want to stop at a particular passage of Scripture and share with you the storyline of one of many of Moses' failures. Come here to Exodus 2, verse 11. Listen to what the text says. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were fighting, struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely, the thing is known. Now at age 40, he sees an Egyptian beating the Hebrew and in his moment of rage and in his moment of being outraged and anger, angry, Moses retaliated and killed an Egyptian, hid his corpse under the desert sand. The following day, Moses tries to mediate an escalating fight between two Hebrew, Hebrew men who were throwing fists over some unknown issue. One of the men paused to ask Moses, who appointed you to be judge and prince? In other words, this man was asking Moses, on what grounds can you stand on your moral authority? Given the fact that just yesterday, you killed somebody. It's almost a crime story like 48, the first 48. I happen to enjoy the first 48, don't judge me. And the premise of this show is that typically someone has been murdered and as a result of such, law enforcement initiates investigation to identify and to arrest the person who committed the murderous crime. And typically it happens within what they call the critical 48 hours. Moses didn't even have 48 hours. Moses was caught in 24. <laughs> now, there's a valuable life lesson to learn from Moses' life regarding his failures. And here it is. Here's the life lesson that God is in the business of using people who have failed. I wish I had some, something deeper. See, now the only, the only group of people that can get happy with this point are those who failed. If you believe that you're above the fray of failure, this point will leap right over your head. The Bible doesn't gloss over failures of its heroes. Noah got drunk and exposed himself. Abraham lied twice about his wife being his sister. Isaac did the same. Jacob deceived his father and cheated his brother out of his birthrights. David sinned with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered. The disciples all abandoned Jesus at the crucifixion and then even beyond that doubted his resurrection. Peter denied Jesus and later even waffled on the gospel in fear of the Judaizers. Mark had bailed on the first missionary journey and in our text Moses murders an Egyptian is rejected by his countrymen, flees for his life, and lives in the desert for 40 years. The story gives us hope because God can use us even after we fail. Come here, D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody gives this insightful statement. Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning that he was a nobody. And he spent his third 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. Anybody in here can testify 
that there was a moment you thought you was really somebody and then failure knocked you off of your high horse and you found yourself in the sand of pity and shame and God says but I'm not going to leave you there because I specialize in using people who have failed. Now you do understand for free there's only one kind of Christian and the one kind of Christian are those who have failed God. Look down your row, right and left. Right and left. Look in front and behind. Those online talking to you. Listen to the reality. We're all failures. We all have failed in some respect. Let's examine Moses because I believe that we can at least identify five factors behind Moses' failures. Can I give you the five factors behind Moses' failures? And I would dare to say that all of us in the list of five can find our factor. Here's the first factor behind Moses' failures. Here it is, and our factors behind our failures. Number one, we fail when we act impulsively. Ooh, come here, come here, come here. Moses had zeal without wisdom, zeal without wisdom, zeal without wisdom when he acted. In this moment of unbridled zeal, Moses thought he was doing the right thing by killing an Egyptian who had engaged in an act of injustice against his fellow Hebrew brother. Here's the point. Because you can do the right thing the wrong way. For free. That's for free. You can do the right thing the wrong way. And let's be honest, how many of us have failed by acting impulsively? Mama put it this way, you act before you took the time to think. And so Moses' acts, action reminds me of Peter. You remember Peter? Peter pulled out the sword in the garden of Gethsemane and whacked off Malchus' ear. Now he was really trying, don't get deep with the scripture, he was really trying to take Malcolm's head off, but he ended up nipping his ear. I like Jesus. Jesus, my type of leader. Every leader ought to have at least somebody packing. <laughs> Something pop off. You need somebody like Peter. Go in that back pocket and pull out that switchblade. <laughs> you know, it is. But then Jesus says, Peter, Peter, Peter. You're doing the right thing by defending me, but you're doing it the wrong way by cutting somebody. Anybody in here can testify? You was right. Ain't nothing, nobody debating it. You was right, okay, you was right. But the way you went about it was all wrong. Let me give you the second way. We fail when we act impulsively, but we also fail when we act independently. Preach, Oliver, I'm trying. Although Moses perhaps perceived in his heart at this time in his life, he was living out his purpose as he is now willing to abandon Egypt and his power, prestige, perks, and privileges so that he can ultimately go serve his people. He was willing to leave the pleasures of Egypt to go live a season of suffering with his people. But Moses could have been spot on regarding God's will. However, his more significant problem was that he did not bother to seek God's way. And not only that, but God's timing. So Moses is acting independently. He's acting by his own impulse and not out of the power of God. How it is that we fail God? Number one, how is it, church? We act impulsively. Come on, class. Number two, we act how? Independently. But then we also fail when we act impetuously. Whether God had already called Moses to deliver his people or whether the call came later at the burning bush, all agreed that Moses had no direct word from God at this time to take this drastic step of killing the Egyptian. Nowhere in chapter 2 does God ever say, go kill that Egyptian. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with Moses. Here's the problem with many of us. 
he started running ahead of God. Impetuous. And here's the point that I want you to catch. We can trace people who ended up being reckless and impetuous in their behavior and in their actions that resulted in unnecessary misery. Some of the misery in your life is because you was too impetuous, too impulsive, acted too independent. Look at Abraham and Sarah. Right now there's hell in the Middle East because Abraham and Sarah got ahead of God and decided to bypass God's promise as God had promised them Isaac. And so they went and got Hagar and ended up having Ishmael. And as a result, there's still conflict in the Middle East. Come here, King Saul. King Saul got nervous because he felt the people would desert him when Samuel had not come as scheduled to give the sacrifice. And here is what the text says in 1 Samuel 13, verse 12. Listen to it. It's a small little phrase. In 1 Samuel 13 and 12, it says, and he forced himself to offer it himself. And he did an act that was foolish as it ended up resulting in him losing the whole kingdom. Remember David? David did it right among all the other stuff he did wrong. He resisted and refused to act impetuously. On one occasion when he was appointed as the next king of Israel, he had the opportunity, watch this now, to kill King Saul and to claim his kingdom. But the text says that David act wisely. And he act wisely, how? He allowed God to move Saul as opposed to him trying to kill Saul. And as a rule, if you haven't waited on the Lord in prayer and sense that it is his time to take action in that next ma major decision you're about to make, keep on waiting. Number four, we fail when we act indiscernibly. Now look at, I want you to see this again. In Exodus 22, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, Exodus chapter 2, verse 12, here's what the text says. Speaking of Moses, watch this now. And he looked this way and that way. You see that? So he looked this way and that way. Here, here's Moses. He's out of the desert. He done killed the man, about to kill him. He... You know how your head is on the swivel when you know you're about to do something wrong? And you're just like... You know when you're at the stop sign and you know you see no traffic coming? And you're like, ain't no need of my just sitting here. And you go... He looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Come here, Moses. The problem is... Your head was swiveling in the wrong direction. Moses was looking this way and that way, but the problem was Moses didn't look up. You catch that doing brunch. He was looking around but didn't look above. He was more concerned about being caught by men than being concerned with being seen by God. Moses, as opposed to looking this way, should have been. Because had he looked up, he would have seen the eyes of the Lord. It's always going to and fro throughout the earth. And the stuff we think we're hiding from man, God says, I see you. I, I, I see you. I see where you are, what you're doing. I see you. Stop looking around and start looking above. Now, if that doesn't cause you to live a little different, you know, when you're doing what you're doing and you're trying to make sure no one sees you, just pause for a moment and say, but God, I know you see me. Here's the last one. He not only act indiscernibly, impetuously, independently, and impulsively, but can I give you the last one? Here's the big one. Are you ready? I'm done. Checking up out of here. We fail when we act ignorantly. 
I mean, anybody here other than myself, anybody here other than myself just acted in a ignorant way? That was just, like, you sit there now, you're like, that was just slap. Ignorant, just, you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> Moses acted ignorantly as he attempted to bury the Egyptian man's body under the corpse of the sand, thinking that no one had seen him. The Bible says someone saw him. News started spreading quickly. Moses tried to cover it up. He panicked. Exodus 2.14 says, surely the matter has become known. Anybody? When I was working on this sermon, out of all the stuff I read and typed out, this was the one that scared the hell out of me. I didn't mean it that way. I can't do that. Craig, you're about to become a bishop. You can't do that. It scared me. Here it is. Surely the matter became known. The thing that you thought you dug deep and you put far under the sand and ain't nobody know about it. You got triple passwords on the phone. <laughs> and she still found it, like, surely. <laughs> it's the same Moses who ends up saying in Numbers 32, verse 23, be sure your sins will find you out. We fail when we think we can hide. And here's the problem, here's the problem, here's the problem. Just play softly, Spence had to help me finish. We end up believing the hype that we are invisible. And when you've been living so long thinking you're invisible and hadn't got caught, you end up convincing yourself you're invincible. Ain't nothing can rock my world. And when you have been able to dodge several bullets, anybody in here other than myself can dodge a couple of bullets. I, I, I know, see the difference with me and some of you, I'm just a bit too raw, I'm just a bit too vulnerable. I, there's been some bullets. I just got grazed. <laughs> just got grazed, you know. Some of them didn't even hit me. Anybody here grateful? Here it is. When you were just ignorant. He says, I'm, I'm letting this slide, but it's only so long until that thing come to light. Somebody sitting there saying, Brother Pastor, you should have preached this to me a couple of years ago. <laughs> Here it is. Three things to take away from Moses' life with failure. I'm done, I promise y'all. God uses imperfect instruments who fail in their attempts of serving God. See, you've been thinking that your failures has discredited you from serving God. No, let me help you. Let, can I, I'm Craig, I'm your friend. Can I help you? Whenever God decides to use anybody, he's always at a disadvantage. Can I tell you why? Because all of the human resource and capital that God has at his disposal are all inadequate, imperfect, and insufficient. God has never chosen someone perfect other than his son, and you're not him. The second thing, that God shapes and prepares imperfect instruments before he uses them. Ooh, this is for free. God says, I'm going to use you, but I got to shape you. And the way I shape you, watch this here now, 
is that I put you into seclusion. Because after Moses got caught, guess where Moses went? To the desert. To Midian. And he was in Midian for 40 years. Bring me to my last point. I'm done. Here's, here's the third takeaway. Let me give it to you for free. Just write it down. God's gracious covenant faithfulness prepares his servant for his people and his people for his servants. You know, God prepared me for you and prepared you for me. You know, that's part of why some of you come to EBC. Because there's a pastor for a people and there's a people for a pastor. Does that make sense? Some of you come because you're like, I, I can deal with Rev because Rev, Rev is a little 100. And then, you know, you do have some people now. Here, let me get this seat for free. Being transparent becomes problematic when you haven't been transformed. That's for free. That's for free. And being transformed does not mean that you got it all together. Cause ain't nobody batting a 100. Ain't nobody in here batting a 100. Anybody in here can testify? I don't strike that a couple of times. I ain't batting 100. But God says, I still want to use you. With all of your deficiencies and defects, I still want to. I want to use your history, Moses. I want to use your shortcoming, Moses. I want to use everything. Here it is. I want to use. The accumulation of your human experience. And here's how I'm going to do it, Moses. Number three, up close and personal. Recognize God has a plan for your future. Recognize that God has a place in your failures. But here's the last one. Recognize that God has a process for your formation. Would you say that God has a process for my formation? And the process for the formation is, here it is, it's barren. It's, incons it's a place, here it is, of pain. He says, Moses, I'm going to process you, but I'm going to process you in a different way. You got to spend some time in the wilderness. I'm going to send you to the wilderness prior to your leading the people out the wilderness. Because you can't lead people out of something you've never been in. Free, 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 free. So I'm going to give you 40 years in the wilderness because my people are going to be in the wilderness as well. And you got to take your wilderness experience and connect it with their wilderness experience so that we can all get up out of this wilderness together. Is there anybody in here that can testify that God formed me in my wilderness? Those days I was crying, those days when I was by myself, those days when I was lonely, those days I was questioning God, those days I wanted to give up on life, those days I didn't think I had it to, to make it, those days that I just wanted to throw up my hands and holler. God used my wilderness to form me and to shape me. He gave me a heart of compassion. He gave me a heart of empathy. He gave me a heart of like He used my wilderness. So whatever you do, don't you become ashamed of your wilderness. That's where God formed you. Can somebody testify, I came up the rough side of the mountain. My life wasn't easy. My life wasn't smooth. I came up the rough side of the mountain. I, I came up hard times and difficult times. But look at me right now. I survived my wilderness. And in that I survived my wilderness, I'm going to help somebody else survive their wilderness. God says, up close and personal. Let's be 100. I got a plan for your future. I'm with you in your failures. I got a process for your formation. So Father, even now, I pray that you would take this word and apply it to the hearts of your people. And help us, oh God, even right now, to walk in the path of Moses. Help us understand that you have a future that's planned. That even in our failures, you have positioned yourself. And for our formation, you have a process. 
Now, Father, I pray for some person today that needs to respond to this word. Give them the boldness, give them the faith to trust you and to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, right where you are, whoever you are, sitting, standing, watching online, this word, I really believe, is a word that God has for all of us. Because all of us need an up close and personal relationship with God. And if you have not developed a relationship with God, that's the first step. You got to know God. You have to respond to his call upon your life. And so I want to send this invitation to you today, my friend, whoever you are, wherever you are, on campus, online. You can start that relationship with God that he desires to have with you that is up close and personal by responding to this invitation. And that invitation is to come to know Jesus as Lord and as Savior so that he can begin to transform you to become the leader, to become the man, the woman that he has destined and even dreamed of you becoming. Here's how you can respond. I'm not going to ask you to walk the aisles of the church. The whole COVID experience has changed even how we go about the intake process of members. You can easily scan that QR scan that is directly in front of you, the seat that you're sitting in, if you're on campus, that is appearing right now on your screen. And as you would respond, you'll be asked a series of questions as it relates to giving your life to Christ, joining the church. And all we want you to do is just say, yes, I want to give my life to Christ. Yes, I want to join the church. Do your part, and then that would inform us, and someone from our church will make contact with you. We'll reach out to you within this week to begin that journey. And as a result of such, we know that God is going to do his part. So you do your part. God is going to do his part. And we're going to join in with what God is doing. So listen, respond today. Obey the voice of God. Now listen, let's come again next week. We're going to journey through the book of Exodus and look at the life of Moses. And I'm going to share with you next week one stumbling block that will keep you from serving and not keep you just from serving, but will keep you from success. There's one big stumbling block that is standing in your way. Come next Sunday, let's talk about it. Until then, be hopeful, be healthy, be helpful, be happy. Peace out.